All right, Chevro, welcome, welcome, welcome to Mentor TJJ Pesach Preparation Part Dos. Very excited to be here. Last week, we started off with the beginnings. We started talking about chametz in general and kashras, how one kashras their home. We talked about bedikas chametz, the searching for the chametz. We talked about bira chametz, the burning of the chametz. We went into what it means, man cheroseinu, a time of freedom. Then we went to Hallel by night, beginning Pesach night. We discussed the concept of the Seder, why we have a Seder and the order of it, the Seder plate and its contents. And then we jumped into the Seder itself. We began with Kadesh, which is Kiddush, that we talked about. It was the first of four cups that we discussed that there's four cups throughout the course of the meal uh, that correspond to the four sayings. And that's where we left off last week. We're going to pick up this week um, with talking about the second step of the Seder. Remember, again, to have your notebooks out and your pencils. Why is because we are giving you the how-to, the step-by-step process that we're going to go through another nine tonight and finish off next week, God willing, um, the Sunday before Pesach. So to begin uh, this week with Urchatz, which is part two of the Seder, I would like to call upon our TGJ president, none other than Ms. Dina Aflaho. Hi, guys. So I'm going to be talking about Urchat, which is washing your hands without reciting a blessing. This is the second step of the Seder. On Pesach, we wash our hands twice at the Seder, once before eating the veggies, and then before we make the hamotzi on the matzah. Now some halacha is that we pour water on our right hand and then to our left. Now it's a stringency to always wash our hands before eating vegetables. However, on Pesach, we're required to wash our hands before eating vegetables, and this is because during because Pesach is the time that is essentially the birth of the Jewish people. Now, water has a sole purpose of turning us from impure to pure, but why would Hashem attribute so much power to water? In order to understand why water has such a spiritual power, we must understand the physical power. Now, water can be found in almost every place on earth, in plants, animals, and even the earth can't live without water. Now, since water has such power, Hashem placed a very holy power within it. Water has the ability to change a person, which is exactly the mitzvah of Ninat Yadayim represents. <laughs> That's it, Abby. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dina Orchatz. Very excited to uh, wash our hands um, when the time comes. Okay. So moving on after Orchatz, after we wash our hands, uh, we do not say a bracha. We move into the next step of the Seder, which is Karpas. And to talk about Karpas and get us ready for that, I would like to call upon Miss Carly Salk. It's okay. So hi, I'm Carly. So Karpas is the third part of the Seder plate, and it refers to the vegetable. It's usually parsley, but it can be parsley, celery, or potato. And this vegetable is dipped into the salt water. So this vegetable symbolizes springtime, which is a time of rebirth. It also symbolizes the Israelites' exodus from Egypt, which marks their rebirth after hundreds of years of slavery. So the salt water that we dip the vegetable into um, reminds us of the tears that the Jews cried while in Egypt. But it's very important that we remember how we got to Egypt in the first place. So the word karpas is the same word used to describe Joseph's coat. Joseph's coat was a fine garment that was given to him by his father, Jacob. And this caused his other brothers to become jealous. And this jealousy is a part of the reason why we got to Egypt. This is the reason we got to Egypt. Therefore, eating the karpas reminds us of the slavery. It is also hinting at us to remember how we got to Egypt in the first place. So the overall message in this is that it's showing us how important it is to not be jealous of each other. We need to treat each other with respect because no matter how you feel about someone, at the end of the day, we are family, so we so rather than being jealous, we need to support them and give them the love that they deserve. So some of the halachos for the karpas is that, um, so the bracha that we use is the berei peri hadama. Probably said that wrong, but and um, so we don't lean while eating the karpas and saying the prayer. And it is very important that while saying this bracha, we remember um, we're thinking about the maror, the bitter herbs that we're going to be eating later on in the seed, because it's the same bracha. <laughs> All right, thank you, Carly. Excellent. Very excited to uh, to to dive into some of those vegetables, some of that carpas. After 
Karpas, the third step of the Seder. We go into the fourth step of the Seder. Yachatz, the splitting of the matzah. I'd like to call upon Mr. Vivush. Take it away, buddy. All right. So, my, uh, so Yachat is the fourth. It's a, all right, let me see. Let's see. Yachat is the fourth um, set in the, in the Pesach Seder. So basically, Yachat is the Hamotzi of Pesach. Because we take three pieces of Motzah, we put, take a, a top one, which correlates to the Kohanim. We take a middle one, which has to do with the Levi. And then the bottom one, which has to do with uh, Israel, like me, because I'm not a Kohen or Levi. So basically, to actually do Yachat, you have to take the Levi um, Matzah, like the middle piece, the middle Matzah, you have to break it into two. So the larger one, after you break it, the larger piece, you have to keep it on the side and you have to save that for dinner or dinner, dessert, which is also like also known as afikoman. However, with a smaller piece, you have to take it and you have to do a mozi on it. So, so I have a question like Pesach is full of questions, there's always questions going on. But here's a question I bet like a lot of people haven't heard. So, we take the mata, we take the middle one, and we break it. All right, even on Shabbat, as I said, it's like the amotzi. You break it like in your, when you do amotzi on Shabbat, you have to rip the matzah or rip the bread, but you can eat it throughout the meal. Like you don't have to save it for dessert. So I'll come for the amotzi on Pesach. You have to take the matzah, the larger one, and you have to save it for dessert. So as you see, Pesach, it's, a, it's all about like poverty and, and coming out of slavery. And matzah is poor man's bread. There's no other way to explain it. So the reason why, why we have to like almost as ration it is because back when the Jews were poor in Egypt, they didn't know exactly when, when their next meal would be. So they had, to keep, they had to save some for later. So just like the Jews back then in Egypt had to save the food for later, us too, we have to live the hard knock life and realize that we're, like, that we're also in the poor mind state right now. Thank you. Yashukach. Thank you, Avivosh. So that is... Yachat, the splitting of the middle matzah. After we've done that, we've hid our bigger piece, as we've said later for Afi Komen, which is going to come later on next week, where we'll discuss that. We then move into, um, we move into Magid, which is the part, the section of where we're actually sitting to actually talk about how the Jews left Egypt, or so we thought. To talk about, uh, about Magid, the next step in the Seder, I'd like to call upon Miss L. Brody. Hi. Okay. So, on the Sedal night, we celebrate our liberation from slavery in Egypt, our redemption and freedom. Leaving Egypt was a monumentous time in Jewish history, but for some reason in the Magid, there's really little information about actually leaving Egypt, but only all the other like background information. So, the straight definition of Haggadah is to tell. So, where is the story? Why is the Magid consisted of other topics and not actually a straight story of leaving Egypt? So... The reason why the Magi chooses this format to tell the story is based on a statement in the Mishnah in the 10th chapter of the Masechet Pesachim, Vedorshin Mirami Oved Avi at Safa Parsha. And then we elaborate on the Pesachim from Arami Oved Avi until the end of the unit. So you're probably wondering, what, is, what does that mean? Why, like, why are you saying that? So Arami Oved Avi translates to an Ara Aramean tried to destroy my father. Again, like, what am I saying? That doesn't make sense. So this line comes from the story of how Laban, the Iranian, and Yaakov's father-in-law intended to slaughter Yaakov and his, and his entire lineage, which would uproot Israel's entire existence. However, it is told that Hashem personally warned Laban not to harm Yaakov. Are you still, are you still not catching on? So this is going to be the first act of anti-Semitism. Now, why should the Magid go through the whole story of leaving Egypt when the best proof of it happening is actually us today? We're still here thousands, thousands, of, years, thousands of years later. So the story, of, the story is much bigger than just Egypt itself. The Jews coming out of Egypt is the birth of the Jewish people as we know it. We needed to go through Egypt to become Am Yisrael. However, leaving Egypt is the beginning of the journey, not the end. That was it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mel. Correct. We are absolutely still here. And uh, that, is, uh, that is what's important. That's what we're going to definitely talk about during Magid. So Magid has in it many, many different, uh, very famous Jewish traditions that we discuss in Magid. Um, so what we're going to do is before we actually get to Raksa, we're going to highlight three portions of, actually four portions 
of Magid specifically that are sort of world renowned and famous. If you're, if you're saying to yourself, when do these things come about? We discuss them in Magid um, right here and there. So to start off with some of these really, really famous themes, we're going to start off with Manishtana since it starts off at the front. Manishtana, the famous questions of the Passover Seder night. Uh, to start us off with Manishtana, I'd like to call upon the very proud mentor, Miss Maya Shamash. Boom. Hi. So today I'm going to be talking about Manishtana. So the four, the four big questions, and we ask them every single year. So in English, what we're saying is, what makes this night different from all the other nights? So the first thing we say is, on all other nights, you eat leaven products or matcha, but on this night, only matcha. And then the second one is, on all other nights, you eat all vegetables, but on this night, bitter herbs only. And then the third one is, on all other nights, we don't dip our food even once, but on this night, we dip twice. And then the fourth one, on all other nights, we eat sitting or reclining, but on this night, we only recline. So these four questions, they really highlight key aspects of what makes Pesach special. And it allows us to dive into the story of Egypt as we go through, like all the halakot of the Seder, and it allows us to really dive into the story. But these, these questions, traditionally, the way it goes like throughout the Seder is, it's usually asked by the children or the youngest family members at the table, but if there are none, like there's no kids at the table, they do have to be asked anyway. So it, depending on the, the family, it can be traditional to ask these questions in different languages. So some people ask it in Hebrew, some in English, in so many languages, and I know that there are some videos of songs out there that can teach you them in Hebrew, so if you can just look it up and if you have any questions, you can always ask me. But um, we ask these questions each year. So why, why do we ask them? What's the point? So the goal of these questions goes beyond the holidays, not just this stuff. So not only though, it keeps the children at the dinner table awake, you know, so they're not falling asleep. They ha you have to make sure they do something. But it also teaches them a really key aspect of Judaism. So Judaism is, is such a special, such a special religion. And what's so special about it is that we are told to question everything. A huge part of what we do is question things because it brings us closer to the truth and closer to Hashem. As like you just have to ask questions. So when we have the children during the Seder ask the adults the questions, we teach them from a young age to ask and inquire after our traditions and why we do what we do. We go through like so many different holidays and events on the Jewish calendar, and a lot of us tend to forget why. So you shouldn't. You shouldn't settle for, oh, it's tradition, that's why we do it. You have to learn about it. Keep asking. You can ask advisors, mentors, peers, rabbis, anyone. Judaism is just such an incredible, it's so incredible. It tells us to ask, and we grow and learn not only as Jews, but as individuals. Asking questions can help us through anything. So another thing that you can know that you may have noticed is that throughout the Seder, after we ask the questions, there isn't really a specific answer that they tell us as to why, as to like, to answer the question. It's not very specific. So, but what that's telling us is that it helps us to understand that even when you do ask a question, you may not get a straightforward answer, but it doesn't matter. Because what matters is that you ask and you continue to ask different questions to find that answer. So those who don't ask questions at all, they often, they can struggle in life, whether it be in math class or Jewish learning or anything, you know, they struggle because they don't know, you don't understand how or why you're doing things. And it's, it's in our nature to want to know why before we do something. So we can easily and often lose ourselves when we fail to understand. So when we keep mute, so like modesty or davening or just kissing the mezuzah when you walk into a room, any of these things, we tend to neglect them and let go of the traditions that we hold because we just don't know why. We don't understand why we do them. So I challenge all of you to ask a question every single day, especially on Facebook, you have to ask the four questions, but ask a question. So even if it's a super small question, a large question, there's a lot of value and meaning that can be added to our lives if we just take a moment to realize and to understand why you or others or anyone can ask a certain way or think a certain way. And there are advisors from TJJ, there's, they're watching this right now, and there's mentors who everyone who would love to tell you and share their love for Judaism and why we do certain things and I can promise you that
that if you ask some questions, you will not be disappointed. And even if they don't give you a straightforward answer, you keep asking. You can ask others, you can ask different questions. So just to kind of tie it back into the holiday, Mani Sana and asking these questions, it teaches us to question what we do and to question everything in the world so that we can grow and we can become the best version of ourselves that we can be, which is really what Judaism is all about. Thank you. Wow, chazak much. Thank you, Maya. Yes, it's important to never forget that uh, we are all about asking questions as Jews, and that really is what Manishtana is all about. Um, moving a light along in Magid, after Manishtana, we come across Another very, very famous one, a song that we are, very, it's very popular in NCSY, we sing it constantly, Vihisha Amda Lavasenu Vilano, to talk about the meaning of what that piece is, and when we sing it, what we should be keeping in mind. Um, I'd like to call upon, where is she? There uh, we go. Anna Freeman. Hey guys, so in Vihisha Amda, we talk about what's probably the greatest miracle in Jewish history the continued existence of the Jewish people and the fact that we as a small and exiled nation have outlived and outlasted everybody else. So the cycle of anti-Semitism really begins in the Pesach story. The Jewish people came to Egypt where they were welcomed with open arms, but as we flourished and began to adapt to Egyptian culture, we were brutally reminded that Jews are and always will be Jews. And as it says in Vihishanda, in every generation, people have risen to destroy us. This pattern of acceptance, Jewish prosperity, and then eventual oppression repeats itself throughout Jewish history. And logic dictates that after nonstop oppression, the Jewish people should not exist. We fought the powerful Babylonian and Persian empires. We battled the great armies of the Greeks and the Romans, and we suffered at the hands of the Russians and the Germans. And every single time, we almost died out, but against all odds, we prevailed. So when we say the Hishanda, our custom is to lift the cup of wine and cover the matzot, but why? The he means and this, which can be taken to refer to the Abrahamic covenant, where Hashem promises Abraham and his descendants centuries of exile and oppression, but also great miracles, a final redemption, and an everlasting bond with Hashem. In Jewish tradition, the cup of wine is also symbolic of Jewish destiny, and in raising it, we acknowledge the true meaning of the Hishamda, which is not just to remember Matilenu Meyadam, that Hashem saved us from their hands, but to remember and reinvigorate the covenant. Recognizing it as not just a one-time thing, but as the binding mark of the eternal relationship between God and his chosen children. Also, we cover the matzot for the same reason why we cover the challah and shabbat, to not embarrass them. At first glance, it doesn't make sense. Why would we care about embarrassing matzot? A simple explanation is that this shows us that the Jewish people, as the chosen nation of a God of love and mercy, are the carriers of compassion in this world. By covering the matzot, we declare our connection to Hashem through a heightened sensitivity for all of his creations and we reaffirm our role as the chosen people. We show that we are and always will be different and hated for bringing morality to this world, but also that we're destined for immortality. You know, Today, we still have our enemies. We have Hezbollah and Hamas. We have anti-Semites and assimilation. We have Arya Tehran, even ourselves. But through it all, we emerge victorious because the suffering is a mark of the covenant, but so is our ultimate triumph. We're oppressed for the same reason we prevail, because we, because we as Jews are destined to be different. So really, we can look at the, play, the pain and the bloodshed and the tears referred to in Vahishams as events of the past and random acts of human cruelty, or we can recognize them for what they really are, parts of the divine plan stemming from the covenant and the repeating cycle of anti-Semitism. So when we lift the cup, cover the matzot, and say Vahishamza, we acknowledge that every waking moment of our existence as Jews is a miracle, except that the covenant still stands. Recognize our role as the immortal nation, and we remember that no matter where we are, we are not truly home, but we still must come back to the covenant to find our purpose, our moral vision, our confidence, our faith, and our future in Israel. I'm done. Wow. Thank you, Anna. I'm not just going to say the Hishamda. I'm going to sing it. I'm going to raise my class, you know, make a L'chaim to that. Because, yes, you know, our enemies, a lot of them are gone, and we are still here chilling uh, year after year. Thank you for that. Moving right along after Vihisha Amda, make sure you sing it with pride. It is one of the songs of Jewish pride, no doubt. Uh, we move on to the part of the Haggadah where we talk about the four sons. Now, the four sons come along and ask in various ways the questions of, you know, what are we doing here? As Maya mentioned about, you know, asking questions, well, here's their, their time to shine. They come in and start asking questions about what it is that we're doing here. So to better understand the four sons, a little bit of insight into that, I'd like to call upon 
Maya Goldberg. So the four sons are not only the four sons, they are the four types of Jews. So the, the four types are the wise one, the evil one, the simple one, and the one who doesn't know how to ask. Um, the wise one, the Chacham, asks, what are the testimonies? And so the story goes, we learn about the four types of Jews through the story. The wise one asks, what are the testimonies and judgments our God has commanded of you? The answer, the, what the father does is explain the laws, just explain it to them. Um, the wicked one, the Russia, asks the same question as the wise one, except instead of saying the commandments that our God um, has, he says, your God. And, and he leaves himself out of it. And the response to that would be break his teeth, basically. But that just means the, re the response is, um, that, that means respond with belittling. He's excluding himself. He wouldn't be taken out of Egypt. He is excluding himself from the Jewish people. The simple one asks, um, what's going on? It's, you're supposed to answer a simple and easy to understand answer. He doesn't, the simple one doesn't know what's happening. He's just trying to figure out what's happening in all of it. it no ulterior motive, no sass, just what is happening. For the one who doesn't know how to ask, you're supposed to open up for him. This could mean set up an environment to ask questions, just try to get the, the, them engaged. Um, so yeah, these are not just four random kids. These are the four types of Jews and we, you can see them all in us. Um, we see the Russia when we ask a question out of spite or trying to stump someone. You know, every, like you go to Shabbaton, you see those people in their first year asking, why do we need to keep kosher? Like they're not doing that because they want to know. We also know that people learn, we also know the people that learn Judaism from a strictly intellectual place. Then we have, we have the Tom, the simple son. These are the kids that didn't get the opportunity to learn about Judaism. They, they're coming from a place of curiosity. They just don't know. Um, the one who, um, the one who doesn't know how to ask questions, they're the NCS wires that show up, they come, but they never really engage. They, they might think that Torah and religion is lame. There's, there's hope for them, they just don't know how to ask. But there's also the fifth son, the secret fifth son. <laughs> they don't even show up. They're not at the Seder. They, at least the other kids, at least the Russia is at the table, but the fifth child is not even there. That's wow, thank you, Maya. Um, what a uh, what an important idea, especially in what we're involved in. Um, you know that there are Jews who are so far disconnected that they don't even have the opportunity to be spiteful. And any chance that we as Jews have to bring them in and to get them involved in their heritage and their culture, their history, we definitely have to make a strong effort for it. Thanks for breaking down the uh, the four types of personalities that can exist within all of us. Um, shortly after we discuss about the four sons. Uh, we move into to some of the technical things about um, us leaving Egypt. And one of the most glorifying moments of exiting of Egypt was what happened right before God took us out. The famous, famous 10 plagues that everybody knows so much about. But why, what, when, and how? I'd like to call upon again, right back, to, uh, to tell us a little bit about these 10 plagues um, and how they work and operate. I'd like to call Miss Maya Goldberg one more time. Where is she? Hi again. <laughs> um, so the, the 10 plagues are blood, frogs, lice, wild animals, death of cattle, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. First of all, why? Why are there 10? Why not just, you're free. Um, so there are 10 because God specifically targeted the different aspects of his rule. Something to remember is that the Egyptians had their own gods, and they thought that their gods ruled over everything, like each god ruled over something. So these 10 plagues pinpointed the things that the, de the, the deities um, ruled over. 
And um, so he, uh, for a bit of perspective, um, the Jews were in Egypt for 210 years of slavery, and there was only one year of plagues. Um, each plague was a month, and there was three months um, for a morning slash warning before um, the next plague. Um, so the plagues are basically there. The, the reason why it's not just one big plague another is to show that God is one and God is perfect. The story is a key aspect of all of Judaism. It shows that God is there to control all aspects of nature. As, and each of the 10 plagues, that's, that's how the world was created. It's to show that God is the master of all the nations. And if it never happened, how would anybody be able to have any faith? All right. Thank you, Maya. Yeah. Uh, listen, and talk about uh, educating lessons. That, that is a intense and a harsh one, but one that's stuck till today. And something that, uh, that Maya highlighted um, was, you know, if, if God can pull off all these plagues and the little mundane things that we ask him in our life, God is certainly, certainly capable of doing. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, and those are some of the bigger moments of Magid when we're actually sitting. And this is for some, this is the longest part of the Seder. Um, but really, it's what we're there for. We sit around with family and friends, really talking about these ideas, discussing philosophy, and getting back into the messages that we should all remember. But that puts a wrap on, on the section of Magid, and we move on to the next uh, section of the Seder, um, the next two sections of the Seder, actually. And this is the last thing we're going to do this week uh, to present the, uh, the two pieces of Rachsa and Motzi Matzah. I'd like to call upon, where is she? Miss Hannah Pool. Hi. Um, sorry if it looks like I'm crying. My allergies are really bad. Um, so I'm doing Achza and Motzi Matzah. So basically, um, Achza is like really simple. It's when we wash our hands before the Matzah and we wash on the right three times and then we do the left um, also three times and we say on the Tilat Yadaim and it's Halakha that like we have to eat the matzah within four minutes of washing our hands. And then matzah is like, it has more meaning to it. It's a little more complex, but basically we make two brachot for um, matzah. We say hamotzi lechem and then we say al achilat matzah. And we break, we break the matzah and then the top half from when we split it, um, we eat that part. And then, in case you weren't aware, challah and matzah are both made of flour and water. One is a loaf of bread, and that's the challah, and then one's a giant cracker. And the difference between the two is that challah is made with yeast, which is with, um, it like has fermentation with like, it's like complicated how it all works and whatever, and how it rises. And the matzah is, doesn't have any yeast, and it's only allowed to cook for 18 minutes and I'll explain that later um and then it also it teaches us about arrogance and humility because um chala which is chametz it's the bread of arrogance and matzah is the bread of humility since the bread can represent oneself and how they treat themselves and like we're always getting it and getting it and getting it and it's like it's really good like we we really like it like it tastes better and it's it represents arrogance so um, we get it all year round, but for eight days of the year, we're challenged to examine ourselves and come to terms with ourselves. And Pesach basically keeps us in check because we have to know that the self is important, but an abundance of like oneself, it makes you become selfish. Um, so the eight days keep us in check and it focuses on teaching us humility. Sorry, Dina keeps texting me. <laughs> Um, and the matzah, it sounds, so, okay, so aside from that, then there's also a lesson that Avi just taught me that the matzah sounds like mitzvah and chala sounds like chetz, which is sin. So we must cook the matzah, not even for a second over the 18 minutes, because then that becomes chametz. And we can apply this to all of our lives by saying that we must take initiative, um, and like the time is now, like this is the time, like 
like we're given those 18 minutes we can't do any further because then it becomes when it's like too lenient and it, it's it's like bad it's basically like you can say like you're gonna do it later like you get inspiration about something or we have things to do but we'll push it off like we'll say okay we'll do it in three weeks or we'll, we'll use this um we'll use this inspiration like after college and like we always delay it but the time is when it's supposed to be and we can't delay the time that God gave us because God gave us opportunity and once we're introduced to it we have to do it and we have to use it and yeah that's it thank you Hannah Poole unbelievable yes the humility of matzah and the the idea that time is very sacred and you can spoil some unbelievable opportunities by by delaying on them we should all have humility and definitely definitely take advantage of the opportunities and be more like the matzah so that wraps it up for this week this week we discussed we picked up after or um, of kaddish last week we talked about orchats washing in the hands for the karpas then we talked about the karpas itself the dipping of the vegetable into the salt water the next step of yachat splitting the middle matzah and saving the bigger piece for the afikomen we dove into Magid, which is telling over the story, and then asked the questions of why there's so many pieces that are not related to the actual story itself, because it brings out unbelievable lessons. First one, Manishtana, that Judaism is about asking questions. Vahisha Amda, that we're living miracles, that we keep surviving over time. The four sons, the different aspects of Jewish education and the different ways to be able to, to explain people things on their level. The 10 plagues, God's mastery over all of nature. And then when we finish Magid, we go into the next the second half of the Seder with Rachsa, we wash our hands and we say Motzi Matzo, where we say Amotzi, and we make the Bracha of Achilas Matzah and learn all the beautiful lessons of the Matzah. We lean to the left because, after all, we are royalty. Um, and that wraps it up for this week. Join us next Sunday at 8 o'clock where we will wrap up with the final steps of the Seder and the, uh, the closing messages. Keep mind again, keep, out, keep a lookout for the, uh, the Haggadah that should be coming out soon. Thank you to all of our presenters tonight, and uh, have a wonderful evening.